Hey everyone, welcome back to the ESA workshop series for Econ 250D1 Microeconomics. Today we will be going over utility functions. This will just be a very brief review of what you've already learned in class and it's going to help you prepare for your midterms as well. The first thing we'll just cover again is consumer preferences. Uh, and just as a reminder, preferences are going to describe how a consumer ranks all of his, pos his or her possible consumption bundles. We're going to see two primary forms of notation here. A, weak preferences. Just a weak preference basically means that one good is at least as good as another good. Uh, and then in strict preferences as well means strictly better that, so one good is always better than the other good, and indifference would never apply in any case there. As well, the notation for indifference is the middle one that we have, the middle line, and that's simply when the two goods are equal in the eyes of the consumer. Now that concept right there is vital to a consumer's utility simply because we can represent preferences with the utility function if and only if they are complete, reflexive, transitive, and continuous. So we can only represent preferences with the utility function assuming that the consumer is rational and preferably well behaved. And again, a consumer is rational if they exhibit completeness, reflexivity, transitivity, and they are well behaved if they exhibit weak monotonicity or some form of monotonicity as well as regular convexity and strict convexity. What we're looking at right now is just a representation of what this would look like in terms of, you know, basic mathematical operators that we'd have seen before we got into this class. So essentially we have that saying that a preference relationship can be expressed as a utility function u if for any two bundles x and y, u, the utility of good x, is greater than or equal to the utility of good y. As well, we can see below that we have strict preferences if the utility of good x is strictly or uh, always greater than the utility of good y. And then of course the utility of good x equals utility of good y, that represents indifference. Now as well, just in terms of translating from a word problem to an actual mathematical situation, you need to understand that utility is an ordinal concept. This means that you can represent consumers' preferences using it. However, utility does not have to be a positive value and is just a measure of a consumer's level of happiness. So this of course has limitations. For example, if you have the utility levels of two consumers, we can't directly compare them. And additionally, just because the utility yielded by good X and the utility yielded by good Y are four and two respectively, you can't just say that good X is twice as good as good Y or good Y is half as good as good X. Although good, uh, although four and two here are both referred to as utility levels, this does not imply that X is preferred twice as much as good Y. And that's important because if a professor is looking to trick you or you have a situation like that, you just have to keep that in mind because obviously when we look at utility functions, you would mathematically state that the utility there is twice as large as the utility there, but that does not translate to in practice with consumers twice as good. Basically what this means is that utility functions do not have information about intensity. That being said, you can always generate an indifference curve if you have enough information about the consumer and you have the uh, description of their preferences. This is simply going to be accomplished and we're going to be working primarily when it comes to utility with indifference curves, but it can simply be accomplished by setting a utility function, one that you've either derived from a word problem or been given by your professor. You're going to set that utility function to a certain utility level. So again, we can see that a preference relation can be represented as a continuous utility function if the relation is complete, reflexive, transitive, and continuous. I already mentioned this around minute two, I believe, but we have it here again, the four assumptions made by preferences or this concept of preferences. And this typically isn't something that you would have to worry about on the exam unless you were really given more of a short response or even a uh, short essay section to a question that you've been asked. But typically because I know your exam is gonna be primarily numerical, you probably will not be expected to recognize if anything is out of line. However, it's still very important to understand what all of these concepts look like graphically and how they interact with what your actual response would be.
We'll take a look at some of these concepts more in depth now, starting with convexity, which basically just says that the agent prefers averages to extremes. So if the agent is indifferent between good x and good y, then she prefers the average tx plus 1 minus y times, excuse me, plus 1 minus t times y to either good x or good y. Preferences are convex if whatever the utility of good y is at least as good as the utility, excuse me again, if the utility of good x is at least as good as the utility of good y. And that, as you can see, the formula right there at the very bottom represents that relationship. Now we're going to move on to our second property, that being monotonicity. We say that preferences are monotone if more of any good makes the agent strictly better off. Assumptions of monotonicity are useful if it implies that an indifference curves are thin and downward sloping. That's very important to be able to actually arrive at a single answer instead of a range of answers and to be able to represent our indifference curves on a graph. Otherwise, it would simply violate plenty of mathematical laws and it would be disgusting and something that we couldn't technically graph. And again, as you can see in the middle of the slide right there, we have the mathematical relationship between these utility functions for monotonic preferences. Now we'll just take a quick look at the utility function and its relationship to indifference curves. Essentially, what our equation right there is saying is that Bundle Y as an element of your affordable bundle, affordable bundle set such that the utility of bundle Y equals the utility of bundle X. And that's the overarching uh, concept behind the indifference curve. So now we'll take a look at our first quote unquote special case of uh, consumer preferences and that's being perfect substitute. So we'll consider the graph above. The slope of the budget line is steeper than the slope of the indifference curves. That's the very first thing you should notice if you graph this out or draw, you put together your numbers for the problem. It's also significant to understand that the slope of this budget line in absolute value is the price of good X divided by the price of good Y. Uh, and this slope, because they are perfect substitutes, is going to be constant, meaning that our lines or our uh, utility curve, or indifference curve, excuse me, is just going to be linear. The slope of the indifference curve in absolute value is going to be your marginal rate of substitution. And as usual, your marginal rate of substitution is just going to be negative marginal utility of good X divided by your marginal utility of good Y. Now, when you're solving the optimality question here for per perfect substitutes, you need to understand that optimality is going to always occur as a corner solution unless the marginal rate of substitution, again being the partial derivative of good one with respect to good one divided by your personal derivative of uh, your utility function with respect to good two. It will always be a corner solution unless your marginal rate of substitution is equal to your budget line slope. What that means is that if the marginal rate of substitution, i.e. the slope of your indifference curve is equal to the slope of your budget line, every single set is going to be an optimal set. Now, just really briefly in more detail, corner solutions can always be identified with your Marshallian demand functions. Wherever they can yield, it's possible for them to yield a negative value. So where our Marshallian demand function in terms of good X is negative, all income must be spent on uh, good Y. Yeah. Uh, and when good Y, of course, is all negative or it could be possibly negative, all income is going to be spent on good X. And again, in the case of perfect substitutes, we say that both of the goods are perfect substitutes to each other, i.e. red pens, black pens, blue pens. We don't really care which pen we have as long as we can write. Now, in the case of perfect complements, the utility function is going to be that. And again, forgive me if I mispronounce it, but it's going to be a Leonti function. So essentially, your utility as a function of good x and y is going to be your minimum of the two functions there. So... And this doesn't have to be just, you know, one or the other. We're likely going to see an equation on each side if he wants to make it more difficult. And then as you can see, our budget constraints are completely normal, that being the price of good X times the quantity of good X plus the price of good Y times the quantity of good Y is just going to equal your budget constraint. Again, in that equation, M denotes income with PX and PY, the price of both goods. And at the very bottom of the slide there, you can see the graph of this uh, situation. So basically, it's just the graph of the indifference curves for perfect complements as follows.
Now, mathematically speaking, the most important thing to understand in this situation is that this function creates L-shaped indifference curves where the vertex occurs and is always going to occur when the price of good one times the quantity of good one equals the price of good two times the quantity of good two. So when you identify one of these problems and you're looking to either graph it or just solve it, if you were to draw a slanted line up through the uh, intersections of both all three sets that you have there, it would intersect at the vertex every single time. And obviously this is going to be where your optimal bundle set occurs every single time. So once you've done that, once you've drawn that line, if you just plot your budget set, it's going to intersect at that point. So when you have a problem like this, you're really, you don't even really have to look at the L's that much. You can really just plot the, uh, what is it? Just plot price of good one times quantity of good one equals to price of good two times quantity of good two. Draw that, draw your budget line, find the intersection point. That's going to be your optimal bundle. And again, this is very basic algebra. It's just the intersection of two linear functions. Now we'll touch briefly on marginal utility, which as you already know, is the partial derivative of one good while treating the other one as a constant. So uh, here we have the marginal utility of good x taking the partial derivative of our utility function with respect to good x. Now, once you have taken this, you can graph it for a single good to demonstrate, you know, diminishing marginal utility. That's how you can verify that visually. And if preferences are strongly monotonic, then your marginal utility is going to be strictly positive. So for here, we'll let x be the quantity of the good where u of x is the utility function, of course, re representing the utility of the good. The marginal utility at quantity x is the additional utility a consumer derives by consuming an additional unit of that good. If the good is infinitely divisible and utility is differentiable, we can use calculus to find the marginal utility. Obviously, this is vital not only to the conceptual part of marginal utility, but as well to be able to calculate your marginal or your technical marginal rate of substitution, which of course you need to be able to do to complete all of the problems on your midterm, specifically the optimization questions. Now, oftentimes we'll see something like quasi-linear preferences as well. Uh, I don't know if Lander has covered that this semester, but if he has, there's a good chance you'll see it on the midterm because unlike perfect complements or Cobb-Douglas functions, this could be, without being like entering the question with a relatively high level of certainty, this could be either a corner solution or a typical solution. So that's something that you need to go through the problem and identify on your own, except like as opposed to going into a perfect complements or excuse me, a perfect substitutes problem, knowing that it's most likely going to be a corner solution or going into a Cobb-Douglas and most likely knowing that it's going to be a typical solution that we would usually see. And again, as part of this function is linear and part of it is non-linear, it is always going to cross at least one axis. And here it's just important to observe that the budget line slope is greater than any marginal rate of substitution from utility. As usual, the typical approach to figuring out whether or not it's going to be a corner solution, we apply that here as well. So again, a corner solution can be identified just looking at your Marshallian demand functions wherever it's possible for them, they can yield a negative value. And then you identify if, you know, the optimal loca allocation between good one and good two occurs where something is negative and you just take the other good and you make that one, that's where you spend all your money. So essentially, if the optimal allocation for good X is going to be negative, then you're going to be spending all of your income on good Y and vice versa. As well, typically the easiest problem that you will see on any sort of test regarding this subject, you would be looking at something like a Cobb-Douglas utility function. So again, that's your utility of good one into good two equals quantity of good one to the price of good one times quantity of good two to the price of good two. And this is gonna yield the constant Marshallian demand function. And that has a few unique properties that we'll touch on in a second, but essentially income is spent at a constant ratio on both goods. So you can just derive immediately from the formulas I've outlined here. And you can also prove this yourself if you go back and do it by hand. Just that the Marshallian demand function for goods one and good two is going to be equal to uh, quantity demanded of good one to the power of A times the quantity demanded of good two to the power of B. And that's just going to, again, yield a constant Marshallian demand function. And there are some unique properties. So we can say that income is spent on a constant ratio on both goods, which is vital to being able to solve these problems extremely quickly. Uh, below, we have the Marshallian demand functions for good one and good two. So you can see just, we'll go over good one. Uh, 
Marshallian demand or the optimal demand of good one as a function of prices and of your budget constraint is going to be equal to A divided by A plus B times your budget constraint divided by the price of good one. Whereas the optimal demand for good two, you're just going to be plugging in the same exact numbers, prices, budget constraint. You're looking at B divided by A plus B times your budget constraint divided by the price of good two. And as well, it's important to remember and understand that the formula to obtain marginal rate of substitution of a Cobb-Douglas utility function is going to be your marginal rate of substitution equals your partial derivative of the utility function with respect to good one divided by the partial derivative of your utility function with respect to good two. And what's different here is that this is also just right off the bat equal to A divided by B times price of good two divided by price of good one. And just looking at the relationship to the two Marshallian demand functions that I've laid out there, that's pretty clear to see. And you should be able to understand why applying this on the midterm is going to save you a ton of time. Now, just before I start to wrap it up here, the next our next workshop is going to be covering consumer choice and optimal bundles. And just really briefly here, it's important to understand that a rational consumer will select their most preferred bundle within their set of feasible bundles, typically the best affordable bundle. Thus, a consumer will seek to maximize their utility such that they remain on or within their budget set. So, of course, it has to be a feasible bundle for them. And assuming that preferences are either regular monotonic or strongly monotonic, the optimal bundle choice will always be located where the indifference curve is tangent to the budget line. So that's why monotonicity is so important. And tangency just occurs where the functions intersect and have the same slope. So that's just how you set up your uh, mathematical equation for optimization with the such that. So we set that up as the functions intersect such that they have the same slope. Uh, just to determine the optimal bundle, one has to complete the constrained choice problem. And this can be solved with calculus typically. But if we are going to apply calculus to solve it, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in the next workshop, it, we're just applying basic optimization. So this is like calc one, calc two stuff. So basically it can be solved alternatively algebraically as well with the optimization condition. Uh, and this condition is satisfied when the slope requirement of tangency, so your marginal rate of substitution, is going to be equal to your negative price of good one divided by price of good two, or where your marginal rate of substitution equals the slope of your budget line. So you would solve for that, you would plug it back into your original equation, and then you would be able to solve for your Marshallian demand functions. So yeah, so basically you're just taking your optimality constraint and plugging it back into the budget constraint, thereby isolating the bundles along the budget line and tangent to the indifference curve. And this is going to yield the consumer's optimal choice in terms of prices and disposable income. That's of course the Marshallian demand function. So you'll get X good one, demand for good one, prime, or demand for good two prime. Knowing that, you also need to understand that that formula, the tangent that I just went on, that formula can only be applied in typical cases. If you have certain special cases, so this would be something like perfect complements, perfect substitutes, quasi-linear demand, you need to understand that you cannot always apply that. And typically, most of the time when you see some of these special cases, you're going to have to remember their special attributes this can be good or bad, right? Because typically you'll have something like perfect complements where we have a little bit of a shortcut as well there. Um, we can just say that, you know, our budget line is going to intersect the formula for where our budget line is going to intersect where good two, the demand for quantity of good two equals A times demand of good one divided by B. So we can pull that out of the formula and figure out our point of optimality very simply, simply because we're working only with linear functions in that case. If you have something like perfect substitutes or quasi-linear preferences, the first thing you need to determine is whether or not it's going to be a corner solution. The case of perfect substitutes, every single point on the budget line or on the utility function is either going to be perfectly optimal or you're only going to have a corner solution. Quasi-linear can either be just a normal case. Probably, if you looked at it visually, there are often times where you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference between that and a Cobb-Douglas function, depending on the numbers you get. Or it can be a very obvious case where it's going to be, again, a corner solution. I think that'll be a great workshop, workshop number three for all of you who are looking to review for your midterm, simply because I assume a lot of the problems you receive, if the test looks something like the one that I had, are going to be very, very much so focused on the optimality and solving the choice problem. I think that about wraps it up for this one.
So uh, I guess I'll see some of you at the workshop in between. I would appreciate just if anyone could stop by workshop number four and just let me know how the midterm went. I hope that not only did your in-class assignments and homework help prepare you for the assignment, but you also benefited quite a bit from these workshops and from the ESA events. Good luck.